So um, we're going to have to sort of fly through this because I haven't got too much time left, but area study two, um, the Ottawa Charter, Social Model of Health, all of it's important, but I'd say those two are the probably most commonly referred to in practice questions. So try and nail them down as much as you can, if possible. So um, old public health, this is related to the government actions that focus more on the physical environment to prevent the spread of disease. So this was a like an old model that um, people looked at for preventing disease. So it looks at more communicable diseases. So things like diarrheal disease, malaria, cholera, things like that, rather than lifestyle diseases. So we focus mainly on, and I recommend writing these ones down, providing safe water, sanitation and sewage, disposal, improved nutrition, improved housing conditions, and better work conditions. Whereas new public health, we're focusing less on the environment. We're still focusing on the environment, but we're looking more on more at individuals' behaviours. So we consider the physical, social, cultural, and political environments that impact health. So focus on our lifestyle and non-communicable diseases, and we're focusing a lot on health promotion. So yeah, communicable diseases are our contagious ones and lifestyle are diseases linked with the way people live their life. So non-communicable diseases. So here we've got a practice question and due to our time strain, I'm going to leave this one here for you guys to have a go at later. Okay, so biomedical model of health. So this model we compare with the social. So biomedical, by just hearing that, hopefully you're thinking of Biomedical is about treatment, about physical, biological um, interventions, treatments, putting in place. So it's a model of care practiced by doctors and health professionals associated with diagnosis, cure, and treatment of disease. So that is the main point of the biomedical, biomedical model. Whereas social, this is about um, directing efforts to social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. Um, which is done through health promotion. So that's a big focus of this topic. Um, and for health status to improve, we must address these um, determinants. And it's targeted on a population basis, so not to, to just like each individual, whereas like biomedical model might be like seeing each patient individually, whereas a social model of health is sort of to big population groups they can address at once. And also the social model of health is basically the same as new public health. So what we just looked at, new public health is literally social model of health. So we've got strengths and limitations for each one. So biomedical model, it's significant advancements in medical technology we can have. Um, life expectancy is extended and quality of life is improved by sort of having these treatments and surgeries and medications available but it does not promote good health practices. We're just treating the consequences of perhaps bad lifestyle choices. We're not actually teaching people to change their lifestyle. We're just treating the effects of what the disease has caused. And not all conditions um, can be cured and treated. So things such as HIV or such as a genetic disease, they can't actually be cured and treated. So um, they can't always help you out here. Social model of health, so strengths is it's typically cost effective because we can target a lot of people at once. Um, and we can also target the vulnerable population group. So the people that really need that health promotion, we can sort of target it to them, um, which is really beneficial. Limitations, health promotion messages can be ignored. So even if we're trying to target a specific um, population group, they may not want to take in the message, they may not be listening, they can ignore it. Um, and not all conditions can be prevented. So genetic diseases can't actually be prevented. So health promotion isn't always going to fix the problem. So yeah, biomedical, we're thinking treatment, diagnose, curing, social, we're thinking of sort of promotion, preventing, um, and educating. So the relationships between the two models, biomedical, we'll just quickly go over this because we kind of already discussed it but it's a band-aid or quick fix approach, focuses on the physical and biological aspects, diagnosing and treating conditions um, that are already present, centers around doctors, health professionals, hospital, health clinics, and the focus is on the individual and attempt to cure them. Um, and here's some examples. Whereas the social model of health, 
It addresses social, environmental and economic aspects affecting someone's health. Um, there's the five principles of the social model, which we will look at in a couple of seconds. It centers around community policies, education and health promotion, not just like sort of hospitals and health clinics. Um, and the focus is to prevent ill health. So biomedical model, we're curing the conditions once something's already occurred. So we're dealing with the consequences after that disease has occurred. Whereas social model of health, we're trying to prevent that disease from occurring in the first place. So we don't even want it to occur. Um, and here are some examples. So any health promotion. Um, so here are some examples of how we can see both the social model of health and the biomedical model of health um, in terms of different diseases. So we'll just look at the first one, but cardiovascular disease. Social model of health might involve education regarding healthy eating in schools to help prevent that from developing or investment in environment in the environment to encourage physical activity. So same with that preventative approach, trying to prevent it before it occurs. Whereas biomedical could be prescribing blood pressure medication to treat the hypertension because it's already occurred. So we're just treating the symptoms and parts of the condition or bypass surgery to treat heart attack and blockage, surgery to treat heart attack. Okay, and then we've got the same different scenarios for lung cancer, also type 2 diabetes, infectious diseases. So if you want to have a look at them, there's some really good examples to help you sort of comprehend the difference between the two models if you're still struggling. Okay, um, so explain how both the biomedical and social models of health could be used to reduce the burden of disease associated with cardiovascular disease. So this is a four mark question. So for four marks, we want two links to burden of disease. Um, the highest scoring students will link once to YLL, so years of life lost due to premature death, and once to YLD. So they're the two sort of parts of burden of disease. So yeah, have a go in your spare time. There's a sample answer on the next slide, but I want you to sort of have a go and come back and go over the answers yourself. So we're going to skip past this. All right, so we're looking at this social model of health now. So we've got five principles and they're called AREA. So this is a really good acronym. So we've got A addresses the broader determinants of health, acts to reduce social inequities, empowers individuals and communities, acts to enable access to healthcare, and involves intersectorial collaboration. So the acronym is a little bit weird. Some of them are sort of in the middle, but um, if you memorize it and get used to it, you will be fine. Um, common mistakes are also saying intersectoral rather than intersectorial and inequities with inequalities. So it's inequities, not inequalities. So we're talking about equity, not sort of social justice equality. So make sure you put the right word in when you're writing your notes. So um, addresses the broader determinants of health. We're looking at all social, environmental and economic factors and how they impact on health, um, including things like gender, income and culture acts to reduce social inequities so we're reducing those inequities so there's that unfairness that exists in relation to the health status and provision of health services due to things like gender age race ses location physical environment so we're trying to level that playing field in terms of our social um, environment empowers individuals and communities so this one's all about sort of giving people the knowledge and skills needed to improve their own health um, empowering them to yeah make better decisions about their health education is key for this one acts to enable access to healthcare so providing health services and promotion that's affordable accessible is a major one and relevant and it's also culturally appropriate for each and every single group involves intersectoral collaboration so this basically just means that making sure that we've got public and private sectors working together different levels of government different groups working together so we've got to a practice question here. Um, so a lot of the questions for this, this is a six, marks qu six mark question, but a lot of them you'll sort of have to state the principle and then refer to the case study. So because this is identify and describe two principles of the social model of health and explain how they're reflected in this project, we'd state two, say what they are, explain how it relates to the program and also make sure we state which actual principle it is with like an overview. So I'm not going to go into this as we're really short for time, but um, yeah, feel free to have a go in your own time.
These questions also are very common. So I recommend getting used to sort of the structure um, of the marking scheme and having a lot of practice with the social model of health and the Ottawa Charter practice questions. As you see them in the exam a lot. And yeah, it sort of breaks it down. So if you want to download the slides and have a look at this later, um, it breaks down the marking scheme and how we got the six marks in the end. Okay, the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. So this is an approach to help developed by the World Health Organization. Um, and it's aimed to reduce inequities, inequalities in health. It's developed from the social model of health. So the one that we just looked at, it's very similar to the social model of health but it is a different one. So we have to be able to see the difference between the two different um, models. The Ottawa Charter is a little bit newer than the social model of health, but it's very similar. So it defines health promotion as the process of enabling people to increase control over and improve their health. So anytime you basically see little quotation marks, it's probably a definition from the WHO or some um, like global organization. So it's important to sort of Make sure you don't jumble up the words. If it's in quotation marks, it's a quote, it's a proper definition. So try and sort of memorize it in that way rather than using it in your own words. So um, yeah, it's commonly confused with the social model of health, but the Ottawa Charter has three strategies and five priorities that we need to be aware of. So the strategies are mediate, advocate, and enable. So mediate is making sure more than just the health sector are working to improve health so we're getting everyone to work together it's sort of like if we think of um involves intersectoral collaboration a little bit on the same basis we're getting everyone to work together to improve health advocate is supporting and lobbying governments so making sure that we want everyone to be promoting um health improving behaviors so we're getting everyone to support our health promotion um and help implement it. Then enable is equal access and education to make positive health choices. So this means that we're actually making sure that everyone can have access to the health promotion and whatever we're promoting so they're able to improve their health um, and giving them education to understand why they need this and why it will benefit them. So yeah, for enable, think equity. We're trying to level the playing field and make sure everyone is getting access to this health promotion and these health promoting behaviors. So we've got five action areas. So I really like the um, the um, acronym bad cats smell dead rats. I think that's a really good one. A lot of people use that. So bad cats smell dead rats. So we've got build healthy public policy, create supportive environments, strengthen community action, develop personal skills and reorient health services. Yeah, there we go. So Build Healthy Public Policy is all about the government and organisations making rules, laws, regulations, legislations about things that will promote um, health. So we might say um, you can't smoke indoors, so that's building healthy public policy. So it's reducing people that will smoke inside, therefore they're less likely to smoke as often. Create supportive environments. So this is making the physical environment encouraging and promoting of healthy behaviors so it could be ensuring children's playgrounds are free from hazards so it's making that supportive environment that will help to promote their health um, strengthening community action so that's bringing everyone to get together making sure everyone's working together to work towards common health goals and promote health so this could be different levels of government working together to implement a program um, develop personal skills. So this is all about education and helping people to be to have the skills to be able to improve their own health. So that could be um, giving a workshop to children on healthy eating and how to make healthy lunches for themselves. So it's giving them those skills to eat healthy and improve their health. Then we've also got reorient health services. So this is about sort of moving away from a biomedical approach and moving towards a social model of health approach. So rather than curing and treating health like curing and treating conditions we're sort of moving to advocating health promotion so rather than a doctor discussing the benefits sorry rather than a doctor just giving um 
say, a medication to help treat hypertension or high blood pressure to someone, they might start talking about the benefits of increasing exercise, improving their healthy eating, um, reducing smoking to help prevent that disease from occurring. So basically, Reorient Health Services, it's a bit of a weird one, but it's moving from the biomedical model to the social model of health to help prevent conditions before they occur. So we've got a graph here um, and we want to explain two action areas that could be used to address this chronic disease. So we're talking about um, arthritis, asthma, diabetes and oral health here. So we want to sort of refer to the action areas and how health promotion could address and improve people's health of these different diseases. So I'm going to quickly skim over this, but basically we've got our two action areas. So you would name them. So we've got build healthy public policy. So then we give a quick explanation of this area. So this involves placing health on the agenda of all policymakers rather than simply the health sector. Then we're linking it to the chronic disease from the graph. So in this one, we're going to talk about type 2 diabetes, I think. So... To address type 2 diabetes, school canteens could stop selling energy-dense or processed foods and only sell nutrient-dense foods that prevent obesity, thus placing less strain on the pancreas, reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. So we've kind of linked it. We've provided all three points for the three marks. And then for the next one, um, we're going to do the same thing. So because there's only a four-mark question, actually, we've only got two marks available here and two here. But if it was a six-mark question, we would get all three. So develop personal skills. This involves educating, in, educating individuals in order to place them in a better position when making choices on their health. To address type 2 diabetes, schools can emphasize the importance of physical exercise every day. So like educating them, which can help to burn excess kilojoules and reduce the risk of obesity and thus type 2 diabetes. Awesome. So then we've got the healthcare system, which we're going to very quickly skim through. This topic is probably one of my favorites. I think it's quite fascinating. So we've got Medicare. So this is Australia's universal health insurance scheme. It provides access to medically essential or clinically necessary healthcare services um, to all Australians and also for countries that are in sort of an agreement with Australia that um, can provide healthcare to them while they're visiting. So we've got a list of things that Medicare does cover and it doesn't cover. So anything clinically necessary. So um, GP consultations, tests, examinations, x-rays, pathology tests, optometry eye tests, um, some surgeries, and then doesn't cover dental examinations, home nursing, ambulance, cosmetic surgery, um, and other things like physiotherapy and chiropractors. So make sure you're familiar with what things it does and doesn't cover as some people can get these mixed up. So Medicare is funded in three different ways. So we've got the Medicare levy. So 2% of the taxable income for those who earn above a certain threshold. It's a little bit complicated in the way they measure it, but this is all you need to know, um, goes towards Medicare. We also have an extra 1% to 1.5% of taxable income for the high income earners without private health insurance um, that goes towards Medicare, which is actually an incentive for people to take out private health insurance if they don't want to pay that um, extra bit of tax because if they have private health insurance, they don't have to pay it, but we'll get into that soon. And general general taxation. So part of it goes towards Medicare as well. So advantages of Medicare, it's available to all Australians um, and also those from countries under the reciprocal agreement. Covers costs for essential services. There's a Medicare safety net, which provides extra financial contri contributions to medical services for those that have spent over a certain amount so they can get extra discounts so they're not paying too much on healthcare. There's no choice of doctor for in-hospital treatments, however. The waiting lists for many treatments are quite long, doesn't cover alternative therapies, and often doesn't cover the full amount for a doctor's visit, only this schedule fee. So there's some disadvantages. Now we have the PBS, so the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. So this is basically a bunch of medicines that are classed as like the most important or like, necess like necessary ones for Australians and they subsidise them so they make them a lot cheaper so a lot more people can access them. 
So advantages, there's a safety net. So people that spend a lot of money on medications get a further discount to stop them from paying too much for medication. Provides access to essential medication at cheaper prices. Provides additional support to those with um, consumption cards and having low co-payments. But disadvantages, we have a significant financial burden on the federal government. So because we're subsidizing all these medications, it does place quite a burden on our government. Um, it doesn't cover all medications, only a few that are listed on the PBS. And for most Australians, there's still a payment. So they still have to pay even though it is reduced. Then we've got private health insurance. So this is an additional cover that people can take out on top of Medicare. It gives them sort of different benefits so they can choose their level of premiums they want to pay for. Um, and it covers services that aren't covered by Medicare. So things like physio, dental services, maternity, etc. So we have incentives that um, sort of are things that help the government to encourage more Australians to take out private health insurance, which we do because this helps take the pressure off the Medicare, like public health system. So we've got the lifetime health cover, private health insurance rebate and Medicare levy surcharge. So these are a little bit weird to explain. So I'm not going to go over them today, but always, as I said, have a look through the notes to um, get a better understanding of them but basically they're different ways in which Australian government encourages people to take out private health insurance as I said to take that pressure off the Medicare public health system and it's all about equity as well like people that earn higher income they will be charged more tax or like they will be charged more of their income towards Medicare whereas those who earn less they won't have to pay as much tax towards Medicare so it's all about like keeping that equity. So advantages of private health insurance, it enables access to private hospital care. Um, you get a choice of your doctor while you're in public or private hospital. There's shorter waiting times, um, depending on the level of cover, some dental, chiropractic, physio, and other services can be paid for. And there's the government rebate for some of them. Um, but disadvantages, it's costly um, in terms of the premiums that you want, they must be paid. So it's like on top of your tax and on top of Medicare and everything like that. Um, there's sometimes the gap, so you sometimes still have to pay even if you have private health insurance. Um, and qualifying periods for some conditions. So you kind of have to have certain qualifying periods to get private health insurance or to get things for free. Then we've got the NDIS, so this is the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's implemented by NDIA. Um, this provides services and support for Australians um, with permanent significant disabilities under the age of 65. So it's not sort of for older people, um, as a lot of people above, um, or like that are older, suffer with different conditions and disabilities and things like this. But this one is specifically for like people under the age of 65 with a significant permanent disability to help them sort of live a life that's more like everyone else their age. Um, and it's provided, the assistance is provided to them, their families and carers. It's funded by the Medicare levy. Um, so there's individualized packages of support for all individuals who meet the eligibility criteria. So there's they have to be under 65 and have a lifelong and permanent disability, but there's also quite a um, intrusive sort of um, interviewing process that people have to go through to be able to receive funding from the NDIS. They have to go through a lot of sort of questions, interviews, discussions, paperwork, a lot of things to be able to get the benefits because um, it sort of assesses to see the level of disability that they live with, so how much support they need because it's individualised for each person that receives the funding to help sort of make it as accurate as possible and not give too much help to someone who doesn't need it or not enough help for someone who needs it more. So um, if we look at all the different parts of the Australia's health system, so we're looking at Medicare, private health insurance, the PBS, NDIS, we need to know based on the study design how they're funded, how they promote sustainability, how they promote access and how they promote equity. So the funding is how it's paid for, how they um, ensure that it gets run. Sustainability is making sure 
It's innovative and responsible to the emerging needs now and in the future. Access refers to making sure people can actually receive the benefits from it so they can actually access it. And equity is ensuring that it's helping people that need it most um, in priority over those who don't really require it. So that leveling the playing field um, concept again. So um, funding of Medicare, we're going to look at Medicare first. So funding is through the Medicare levy, Medicare levy surcharge and general tax access. So it's heavily subsidized um, medical services, making them financially accessible. And there's a reciprocal agreement. So meaning people from other countries that are within the reciprocal agreement can also access our healthcare. There's the Medicare safety net. So people um, are protected from spending too much at once and low income earners are exempt from paying the Medicare levy. And it's just the higher income that pay more. Sustainability, so not all healthcare services are covered, only those that are deemed medically essential. Okay, PBS, so this is funded through general tax. Access, so prescription medications are heavily um, discounted, making them more accessible to everyone. Um, equity, there's the PBS safety net um, and concession pricing schedule. Sustainability, not all prescription medication is subsidized, only those to be life-saving or disease preventing, so only those extremely necessary um, to save money on less essential um, medications. Then we've got private health insurance. So funding, um, this isn't funded by the government or anything. Private health insurance is however much a person wants to pay for their own premium. So there's sort of different levels of premium. So they pay depending on what level of cover they want. So the, own, the person that has private health insurance pays for this themselves access so this helps to enable more access to healthcare um, for the public health system so for medicare because it's reducing that pressure on the health care system um, there's also access to healthcare services that aren't covered by medicare then equity we've got the private private health insurance rebate so income tested so this probably won't make sense so make sure you look at the incentive schemes that we looked at before so that you kind of understand the equity side here um, and sustainability, it alleviates pressure on the public healthcare system. So that one could also be for access. Some of them sort of cross over um, and waiting or qualifying periods ensure customers stay within an insurer long term. Then in NDIS, we've got funding is the Medicare levy um, and also the government as well. So the state and territory governments that are participating in the NDIS, they also fund it. Then access, um, it helps the people with disabilities to access mainstream services and support and access to assistive technology. So things like wheelchairs or like certain equipment they need in their home that they might not be able to afford, the NDIS helps them to access that, which helps them to live a more like normal life than um, what they sort of had before. Equity. So this helps participants lead an ordinary life. Um, participants with greater needs and support requirements receive more support or funding than those with like not as great needs. So it's sort of, if someone is has quite a severe disability, they will receive more funding than someone who isn't quite as severe. It's just sort of making sure it's fair um, and the funding is spent where it needs to be used. And sustain